Hello, everyone, and welcome to this My Jewish Learning event with Julie Seltzer as we take ourselves into the Scribe Studio. Julie is a Torah scribe and educator. Her hand at work is featured in the cover image of Safaria. She has held education positions at Congregation Beit Simhat Torah, the Charles E. Smith Jewish Day School, University of Wisconsin Hillel, and as scholar in residence at synagogues throughout the country. Julie also coordinates all of 70 Faces Media's live online education programs. Julie, we are so excited to have this program today, and thank you everyone for your patience as we've worked out some technical problems. Thank you so much for the introduction, Mira. I'm um, glad folks made it. Yeah, sorry about um, a wrong link. And we are, we are starting a little later, but don't worry, the recording will be up if you need to leave early and um, aren't able to watch the whole thing. So uh, it's fun to be on this side of the Zoom. I'm usually hosting the teacher, but sometimes I also get to teach. So I'm very glad to be doing that. Um, and I have a presentation, a PowerPoint presentation that I'm going to share and um, share about how Torahs are made, um, as well as um, as well as about some of the materials and a little bit about how I got into this because people always ask me how did you even end up doing this. So I'll share a little bit about that. I also love taking questions, so if at any point there are questions, please um, let us know. You can put it in the in the chat box, um, and I I will probably stop periodically and uh, and check for questions. And at the end, we'll also have the opportunity to ask more questions. So, uh, oh, and one more thing that I will do is that I will show you like an up up close what it looks like to um, to be writing. I have a, a camera that zooms in, so you can actually see some of some of the writing. Um, already a question. I love it. All right. So, <laughs> so sure. Let's start there. Let's start with the question and then, I'll, and then I'll start my presentation. How are scrolls stored? Um, once they're finished, they're usually stored upright um, in a, a own in uh, a closet, like a closet. Sorry. That's like the Hebrew, modern Hebrew translation in a, um, an ark in a synagogue. That's kind of typically where they're, where they're stored. Um, as they're getting written in my home, they're stored in a, kind of like a museum quality large box, the sheets piled up. So on that note, I'm going to share my screen because actually that is where we're starting. We're starting with the Torah um, piled up in sheets. This is before it is sewn. Um, and it's just, I think this is, just, it's such an interesting way to look at the Torah um, before it's scrolled up. I'm, I'm sure some of you at least have seen on, I know on Simcha Torah, a lot of uh, congregations, or maybe not a lot, some congregations unroll the entire scroll and it's held up. Um, by the way, it is kind of as dangerous as it looks in the sense that I, I, I get multiple calls after Simcha Torah, like we have a rip in the Torah, something happened. Um, so it is, it, it is fun to look at, but it also can be, you know, gotta be careful. Um, so this is, uh, this is actually a whole, I, I believe a whole Torah. I can't remember exactly when I took this picture before it is sewn. A Torah has, I happen to know the exact number, 304,805 letters. And it takes about a year and a half. It, can take some scribes just a year. It takes me a year and a half. Um, I guess I'm just a little bit uh, slower and I have not gotten any faster with the years. I've been doing this about 14 years um, and I write at a similar pace as I did when I started, maybe a little bit faster. Um, so how did I get into this? Um, this is me at my bat mitzvah. Um, I, as you can see, I had the opportunity to read from the Torah. I look very serious, don't I? <laughs> uh, and this was, so this was a, a conservative congregation and um, girls had bat mitzvahs and on Saturday morning and we read from the Torah scroll. And I have to say, I really did love reading from the Torah scroll even back then. Um, and on the other hand, I did quit Hebrew school right after. So how was it that I got from uh, Hebrew school dropout to um, writing a Torah 
at the Contemporary Jewish Museum in San Francisco on display. This is uh, 2009. I think that the zoom bar is covering the day. Oh, there we go. Um, this is 2009. So this is what I, I mentioned. I'll tell a little bit about my story. And if there are further questions in that direction at the end, I'm happy to add to it. But um, just a quick, quick um, overview of how uh, I got into this and why. So my background um, was actually in theater, mostly, and uh, but I always loved Hebrew, and I always loved the language and the letters and everything about Hebrew, and I loved chanting Torah, and I loved Judaism, and I loved the ritual, but it actually never occurred to me that, I mean, it never occurred to me, it did occur to me that someone wrote the Torah. I did know that someone wrote the Torah by hand. It never occurred to me that I might be one of those people. First of all, uh, I was not a visual artist. I had never held a calligraphy pen. Um, but one day um, I was walking down the street. I was actually visiting Israel. I was living at a, a Jewish retreat center called Isabella Friedman, working as a baker. So I was, I was very, you know, very involved in Jewish community, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I chanted Torah and all of these things. But it just never occurred to me. And I was walking down the street and one moment, uh, I just like a light bulb went off. And I said, I, I want to learn how to write the Hebrew letters. Um, not I want to become a Torah scribe because I, I didn't quite go, get that far in my, even in this, you know, epiphany. I, um, but I came back home and I went to the calligraphy store to get practice materials and I had absolutely no idea what I was doing, but I persevered and I practiced and I practiced. And uh, most importantly, I found teachers. Um, these are kind of three of my main teachers. Um, first, I found Jen Taylor Friedman, um, who, really, uh, who really guided me on a weekly basis in the, not only the calligraphy, but in all of the rules that surround um, writing uh, what's called STEM. Um, and I'll, I'll get to that in a moment but basically all of the ritual, uh, ritual objects, including the Torah. And, um, and then I went to Israel and spent some time studying also um, with Shoshana Guggenheim and uh, Dove Lehman, who, has, who teaches at um, the Pardes Institute and uh, teaches, uh, teaches sacred writing. So the acronym I just mentioned, I am a, sof a ferret stum. People say so fair or so ferret, but that really just means writer. Um, and so the full term is a Sofer, Soferet Stam. Stam is an acronym that stands for Sefer Torah, Tefillin, and Mezuzah, uh, also Megillah, because these are the things we are trained to write. Um, the, they have to be written in a certain uh, manner. And uh, I'm gonna go over some of those, some of those rules. Uh, I'm just going to, I'm going to pause for a second to see if there are any questions in the chat box. Okay, so uh, Vicki asks, are scrolls written by women accepted by all denominations? Um, it depends on what scroll. A Torah scroll is not um, accepted, as far as I know, in any Orthodox synagogues, um, if it's written by a woman. However, a Megillah, a scroll of Esther, is accepted at least um, at least in some Orthodox congregations, and um, and then you know certainly in Reform Reconstructionist, I think um, for the most part, I think in all conservative synagogues at this point, um, scrolls written by women fully uh, fully accepted. So yes and no. Okay. I'm going to start here because this is really the way you start everything in every single aspect of the creation of a scroll. You make a statement of intention at the very beginning of any of the processes. So take it all the way back to preparing the parchment. I'm going to get into the parchment, um, what the scrolls are written on in a moment. But when the person who's doing the preparation of that parchment takes the skin before they even put it in the line to clean the skin, they make a statement out loud that they're doing that for the sake of the sanctity of sacred writings. Um, these days, it's, it's usually like a, a coverall, like all sacred writings, and if it's used for something non-sacred, it's okay. It's, it's a little more generalized. Um, 
but it has been in certain other points in history, you know, specifically for a certain uh, sacred object. So I'm preparing these skins for the use uh, in a sacred mezuzah. And you say it, not only do you think it, but you say it out loud. So this is also true for before you start to write. Um, I, before I start a Torah, I say out loud in Hebrew, Hareini, Hareini Kotevet, the Ani is, is actually extra. Hareini Kotevet, L'Shem Kiyushat Sefer Torah. I am writing for the sake of the sanctity of the Sefer Torah. Now, what's interesting is I don't actually have to say that every day. Um, I only have to say that once before I start, once in a whole year and a half. Now, I certainly can repeat it, and I personally do repeat it as a, as a reminder, um, but that one intention really covers you for the, for the entire process. The same is true for the sewing or um, for Torah repairs. If you're uh, making a repair on a Torah, let's say you're re-inking the letter, you would also say, I am making this repair, I'm writing for the sake of the sanctity of the Torah. Okay, the parchment. So the parchment is made uh, from kosher animal skin. There are, generally speaking, two kinds of parchment. There's cloth, which is the most common now, and there's gvil. Gvil is the full skin, it's thicker. Um, deer skin, for example, it's a, it, it's a, you see it used most often in like North African scrolls um, will be made on, will be written on gvil um, or have been written on gvil, I should say. And then, uh, and today most of the Torahs uh, are, are written on cloths, thinner, um, but they're both made from animal skin. It's just a slightly different process um, and looks a little bit different. So let's see if we can come up with the, uh, the kosher animals. Um, there are sort of, I'd say, four main ones that are kosher enough. <laughs> when I say kosher enough, I mean kosher. And large enough for, um, for a Torah to be written on. So you can throw those in the chat box. Let's see uh, what we can come up with. Look at that. Uh, First, the first animal mentioned is a goat. Actually, that's interesting because <laughs> because usually a cow was the first thing mentioned. I see cow now also came into the box. Um, the way you can tell a goat scroll from any other scrolls is not by how it looks, but by how it smells. If anyone has spent time near a goat, do you know that uh, it smells, you know, goaty? Um, so you can actually still tell that from smelling the scroll. And thank you, a couple people put in the box uh, deer, which is one of the other, um, one of the other kosher animals that is used for, uh, for making Torah scrolls. Now some of, the, some of these kind of like less common animals aren't really used just because they're not, you know, there's not so many of them. Um, but, you know, technically speaking, any kosher animal including a giraffe, uh, could be, you know, could be used, but, but typically, um, you know, it's an animal that there, there are a lot of animals. And interestingly, you, first of all, you're not permitted to kill an animal for the, oh yeah, sorry, and one, and the fourth is sheep. Thank you, Cheryl, the fourth is sheep. You're not permitted to kill an animal with the intention of using its skin for sacred writings. You can slaughter it for food, um, that's permitted in, in Jewish law, and then you could use its skin for sacred writings kind of like as a afterthought, but not as the intention. Um, also, interestingly, you can use any kosher species. It needn't have been slaughtered in a kosher manner in order to use the skin for sacred writings. So this means it can, in the, you know, for example, with the deer, it can have been hunted, which would not be considered kosher for eating, but is considered kosher for the parchment. Um, also, and I, I used to joke about this, but I, I heard that there are a couple people who are actually trying to do this now, uh, somewhere in the West, the Rockies, um, roadkill tefillin. Um, you know, uh, uh, lots of deer around where I live, deer get hit by cars. Um, and it's, I mean, it's really, 
traumatic to see. And, um, and I think that the idea is that this is one way to potentially elevate um, that, those skin. So disease, yeah, uh, accident, yeah, road kit, right. So disease, I think it would depend if, the, you know, if it affected the skin. Um, but, but certainly, yeah, accident. Is there a such thing as a vegan or vegetarian Torah? Yeah, I understand that this is upsetting for, uh, for animal lovers. I, I hope that it's a, just a, a little bit um, helpful to know that it's not permitted to kill them for the, si for the sake of the writings. Um, there currently, it, it's not, it would not be considered kosher if it was written on something other than animal skin. But perhaps at some point that will shift. And certainly early fragments of Torah text have been found on papyrus and, you know, and, and other um, materials. It's just that at a certain moment in time, um, the halakha, or the, the Jewish practice, was determined that it would be written on animal skin. Um, and part of the reason for that is that it, it does last a long time. And papyrus does too, but, but I think, um, you know, and, and parchment, of course, is not special or was not special. It is kind of special to Torahs now, but it was not special for many, many years just for Jewish writings. You know, it was used, of course, by, uh, by a lot of people who were, were writing all kinds of things. Um, so, uh, so there's that. All right. Um, anything? Oh, so just to, in terms of these pictures, right? It's a whole process to prepare the um, to prepare the skins. It, it's not a day long process. It's more like a month long process. And um, and I I do not make my own uh, parchment. My neighbors would not be happy about that. Um, I buy the parchment and also all of the supplies at a store um, in Jerusalem. I have it shipped. I, I used to live in Israel, and now I have it it shipped to my um, to my house in, in New York. So, um, on the right, <laughs> these, you know, these, what look like blotches, like as if someone spilled coffee on the, on the Torah, you know, Torahs are not just like white background with black, uh, writing, even though there is this idea of black fire on white fire. It's not exactly that. Even the white is, it's more when it's white, it's off white, kind of beige, kind of tan. And it often has, you know, like, big sections of um, brown or kind of closer to black, like comes out more like a gray. I mean, the, it's been processed. So it's not as, you know, a sharp color that, um, that it was, you know, but, but you can still, you can still see it and, um, and feel that. And this at the bottom, you, I think you can even see from the picture how the look of the gvil is slightly different from the look of the parchment. All right, next. Um, so I write with a turkey quill, a uh, turkey feather. I think, I actually think the quills pictured on the left here might be goose feathers. They don't look like turkey feathers, but my feathers are uh, turkey feathers. I'll just hold it up in the screen. You can see they don't come as a pen, right? They, they come with a closed, a closed tip and I have to cut them. The most ancient instrument and one that is still used by some scribes is a uh, reed, um, which is also, I mean, it's a plant that grows along the banks of the water and it also is hollow in the middle. So it's carved much in the same way as a feather. And there's an ink channel placed in the center and that holds the liquid ink. Um, it used to be, again, common to write with a feather. Now it's definitely not common to write with a feather. I joke that me and Harry Potter have this in common. Also, we share the same birthday for any Harry Potter fans out there. Um, just a little, you know, little side note. Uh, okay, a couple of questions. If they're not coffee stains, what are they? Oh, they're just, they're just the color, the color patterns of the animal skin. Um, so like when you see a cow, so, you know, you see like a, it'll be like half, white half brown kind of in splotches and that's what that's what you're looking at okay um the ink is typically it doesn't have to be it's typically a gall ink a gall ink has been used for many many years um and uh gall ink is made in part from gall nuts which are formed on a tree after a wasp has 
laid, uh, laid its eggs on the tree. The tree kind of has like a response, almost like an allergic response, and forms these, um, these balls, these gall nuts um, on the tree. That's what you're looking at on the left. On the right, you're looking at the inside, that is the larva. And once it becomes an adult wasp, it pokes a hole in that ball and it flies away. And then we take these, call, what, what are called gall nuts, and crush them up. We, I say we, I mean, I don't actually make my own ink, but um, I crush them up and there are, uh, you know, other ingredients that it, that it combines with to make for a very permanent, very black ink. Um, and if you, if you have seen, especially newer Torahs, um, you'll see that it has, there's a sheen and the ink kind of sits off atop the parchment. So that's, um, that's part of the idea of this ink it, and it, it's, it's pretty viscous. So you can buy it in different, um, viscosity levels, different like, um, uh, thickness levels. And if you need to, you can water it down a little um, or let it evaporate a little and get it to the consistency that you are interested in. I saw that there was a question about where do these rules even come from? A lot of them can be found in the Talmud, um, as ancient as that, not as ancient as the Torah, right? So the, the Torah itself does not tell us how to make a Torah, in part because there, you know, there wasn't the making of the Torah scrolls at that time. Um, so this was really a later, by the, by the time, you know, the Torah um, in all of its, you know, all of its pieces kind of put together, um, we're talking, you know, times of, of Ezra and um, in, in exile. So, um, but, so, so that's, you know, when the, that's when they kind of started to, you know, to come about and then uh, more and more kind of compiled in the Talmud and, um, and then, since then, there have been various, you know, compila halakhic compilations. There's some something called the Keset Hasofer, uh, which translate to, translates to the inkwell. That is kind of like the compendium uh, or a compendium for scribes who are who are learning. Okay. Yeah, someone commented, uh, I see, about how it's interesting to think about the wasp's involvement, given that it's a non-kosher, uh, creepy, crawly insect, the wasp's kind of involvement. But, but to be clear, the wasp has, uh, has left. Uh, how, are the gallnuts farmed, or are they collected in the wild? I, I assumed they were collected, but um, I, I didn't think they were, you know, I'm, not, I'm actually not sure. So does the gall ink last forever? I mean, forever is a long time. It, it doesn't last forever. It does start to actually, I mean, it can fade, but it mostly starts to crack. Um, and I, you know, I've, I see when I repair older Torahs, you can see that the, that it will start to form these teeny tiny holes and, um, and it, you know, it starts to crack and that's a problem that has to be repaired, the old ink scratched off and new ink um, put in. In terms of how long exactly, it really depends. It depends on how the Torah was stored. It depends on all, how much it was used, all kinds of uh, factors. Yeah, gall nuts. Oh, there are a couple of different kinds of trees. Yeah, so oak, oak gall is, um, is, is one of them. Exactly. Is all the ink the same shade? Uh, Mm, that's a good question. I mean, I think maybe slightly different shades, but all black, basically. Okay, so here are, uh, here's just sort of like a snapshot, a taste of some of the rules of letter formation, and some of what the letters look like. Um, there are many, many different styles of letters, but all of them fall into a single category, like a single alphabet, what's called Ashurit. Um, and Ashuri is, is actually a slightly later um, Hebrew alphabet borrowed, um, borrowed from the region of Ashur, Babylonia. So that's why it's called Ashurit. Um, and that was, that became the, the Holy Script. And it's very similar to block Hebrew. So if you read block Hebrew, like print Hebrew, printed Hebrew, you can mostly read the letters in the Torah. Sometimes there'll be a letter that's made kind of slightly differently. Um, and you, you know, you might have trouble reading that particular letter, but overall the script looks, you know, very, very much like printed Hebrew. I was trained to write um, Beit Yosef letters, which is sort of like a classic Ashkenazi style um, 
lettering. And here are some of the letters on the left. Um, you know, you, you could, you know, could do like broad, broad categories, Ashkenazi, Sephardi, and but, and but within those and kind of beyond those, there are lots, I say are, more like were, lots and lots and lots of, of different styles. And I say were because much like everything else in the world right now, um, there is less and less diversity. Um, less diversity of species, less diversity of languages, less diversity of scripts. So I should say fewer, fewer and fewer, um, fewer and fewer types of, of scripts. Because what happened was with globalization, you, you know, you have the positives of, for example, I can, you know, I can look at a Torah, scanned Torah from someone in Israel, and copy from that Torah. Whereas before, I would have to copy from the local Torah. So there were much more localized different styles. And now there are booklets of scanned Torahs that are passed out to scribes. And we're all copying from these same few, you know, very talented scribes, but they're all writing, you know, there's just a, a few of them. And so there's much less diversity. But if you look at older scrolls, um, you can, you know, you can really see, you really see a lot of different types of, um, of script. Okay, so in the center, I just, this is just one example of a certain letter. Uh, letter, rules for the letter Yud. This is not the entire set of rules for letter Yud, but one of them. Its leg must be short, not long. So that is not similar to a vav and potentially made possible by a, by a child's reading. So one of the main things you need to avoid when forming the letters is that it, any one letter can't look too much like another letter. So a yud with a long leg, as you can see, the one in the middle here, right? This is kind of the ambiguous yud vav, what is it? Here is a clearly a vav, here's clearly a yud in the middle, mm, not okay. Right, and what happens, what they made is potentially made possible by a child's reading. First of all, possible means not kosher. Why a child's reading? Well, what happens actually is that if you're unsure that a letter is kosher, let's say you're chanting Torah um, and on the spot and you see this, right? And you're like, well, it's not clearly a vav, but it's also not clearly a yud. So what do you need to do? You actually need to ask a child. Um, and whatever that child, the child, you cover up the letters that come before it and the child comes up and whatever the child says goes. Um, that is the, they've determined the status of the letter. So you wanna be careful and not have the potential of, you know, some, the child, you know, this ambiguous letter, oh, we have to get a child, they have to read it, et cetera. Um, I just put this picture here because I thought it was kind of funny. Um, I am a righty, and so I did need to learn how to write in because Hebrew goes from right to left, and so I needed to learn how to hold my hand so that I wouldn't smudge, that my wrist wouldn't smudge uh, or get smudged by the wet letters because the letters remain wet for about 20 minutes. Um, but the smudging accent that I'm showing here is my, my whole arm just slipped and fell into the... Um, the line that I just wrote. And so this is like a backwards line of Torah on my arm. Uh, yeah. Okay, let's see if there's any questions. Does each scribe have his or own penmanship? Does a scribe sign the item in any way? Um, so generally a scribe does not sign. Uh, it depends what. A Torah, certainly not. Uh, Torah cannot have any marks other than the, the words of Torah, other than the letters of Torah. It can't, it can't have any vowels. It can't have any, you know, uh, Parsha, this Parsha starts here, or chapter seven, or whatever. It can't have the scribe's signature, it can't have any illuminations, it can't make. Um, Megillot have traditionally sometimes had um, not only si like signatures and colophones, you know, this was written by so and so, you know, in Italy in the year such and such, the daughter of such and such. Um, so th those have been signed. And in terms of penmanship, even if I, I mean, while all the scripts are now very similar or there are fewer, you know, fewer types of scripts, at the same time or in the same breath, you can't actually totally copy someone else's writing because it's your handwriting and it's as unique as a fingerprint, right? So in a way, yes, we all have our own uh, handwriting. And whoever asked about the lefties, 
Uh, no, it's not really easy for, for it's not really easier for lefties because lefties encounter other issues other than the smudging. Um, it's complicated. <laughs> um, and I no, I don't use an armrest, um, though I, I have in the past used a, a special scribe table that did have kind of a cushion at the bottom. Um, I don't I don't have it uh, these days. Why can't there be vowels? It would make it so much easier. I know. Um, so the reason it doesn't have vowels is because it didn't originally have vowels. Um, it didn't have vowels because Hebrew, what, it wasn't pointed. I mean, it's still not pointed. If you go to uh, Israel and you read the newspaper, there are no vowels. Um, there are only vowels um, in things that are intended for people who are learning how to read. And I think the idea is that we're not sure necessarily, you know, if we were going to add the vowel, we want to keep it the same as it was, as it, as it always has been. Um, so that is, I think, you know, why there aren't uh, vowels. Um, so how much time does it take and how many, how many hours a day? So I'll, I'll preface this by saying I, um, I am not writing a new scroll right now. I'm working mostly in repair. But when I was writing new writings, I would write a column in a day. And a column has, in the layout that I, uh, that I was doing, 42 lines. So that's 42 lines in a day. It's about five hours of writing. Um, and then, you know, broken up into, you know, with breaks in between and other things like, you know, cutting the quill and emailing the store. It's, I mean, it's a full day, but in terms of the writing, it's, it's about is close to five hours, which is exactly a lot of, a lot of writing. Um, and, uh, and that would be, I'd work on that, you know, for uh, really five days a week, maybe half day on, um, half day on Friday. Um, are the Hebrew letters different for a Sephardi congregation than uh, others? So, so again, sort of there, you know, there could be like multiple categories we could um, kind of divide the scripts into. And, you know, overall there is kind of a distinction between say Sephardi scripts and um, Ashkenazi scripts. The Torahs will be the same. There is one, the Yemenite Torah is slightly different. I think it has like 11, 10 or 11 different letters. It's really, it's like different spellings of, of words. But other than that, all the words are the same, all the letters are the same, um, but the scripts are slightly different. Uh, one classic way to identify, a, say, a Sephardi scroll is versus an Ashkenazi scroll is the shin is flat on the bottom, whereas Ashkenazi has the script has a pointed shim. That's kind of one you know, identifying uh, feature. Okay, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna move on to the next slide. I, I see that there are a few more questions. I just want to get through a, a few more, uh, uh, maybe a couple more slides before answering the rest. Um, I didn't uh, I didn't address this yet. If you were wondering if the entire Torah was in my head, if I had memorized it, definitely not. And in fact, that would not be permitted which is, you know, which makes sense because we want to keep it exactly the same and we know that our memories are fallible. So we do not write from memory, not even a small part, not even my bat mitzvah portion, not even, you know, the parts that I know, like the back of my hand. We have to be looking at an existing scroll and copying it and actually saying out loud all of the words before writing them. So not only have I written the words of the Torah, I've also said all of them out loud. Um, and this is the tikkun that's used. It, it has like different symbols that tells me, is this line shorter than normal or longer than normal or kind of average width? Because the columns have to be aligned and you're not allowed to put half of a word on a line and a dash with the rest of the word on the next line. You have to, you know, fit it all in. So sometimes you'll see like this, um, these arrows are pointing at slightly stretched letters so you see, um, you know, if you look in your Torah scrolls, uh, you may have seen like extended letters, like kind of stretched letters. Those are not, those don't have any particular like mystical meanings or any reason other than the scribe needed to align the columns. Uh, and that's why they're there. On the right, you see my, my teacher, Jen Taylor Friedman created this is just to give you a sense of, you know, how, uh, how you even go about like, you know, writing the whole Torah. This is a chart and, you know, I keep track. What, did, what have I written? These are the column numbers. There's 245 columns. The different colors represent um, the different books. 
And so you can kind of see where you're at. And as you can see, I've crossed out this panel. You don't have to write the Torah in order, which is a good thing because if you needed to write it in order and you messed up a letter or a word and had to go back and fix it, if you couldn't fix it, like because you'd be creating it after everything else, then a Torah would never get written. By the way, a mezuzah and tefillin do have to be written in order. So that's why they're really difficult to write. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm not used to talking this much. Okay. Um, is being described more of a profession for men or women? I love that. Um, I love that this question was asked because it's only fairly recently that um, women have become Torah scribes. Uh, when I say recently, I mean in the current century. Um, my teacher, Jen, was, as far as we know, the first woman to write a Torah scroll. Not the first woman scribe. There have definitely been scribes in the past. But as far as we know, the first one to, to write uh, you know, a Torah scroll that's used in, um, uh, in synagogues as part of the ritual. She finished her first one in 2007. Um, and I finished my first one in 2011. Um, do you write when, so I'm going to stretch this out. Do I write when I get a commission or do I wait, do I write in when, and then wait for a customer? I, I write by commission because it takes a year and a half and I just don't have that much money packed away to manage that. So yeah, it's only, only by commission. Um, okay. So I, I'm going to, so the person, so Lisa who asked about Shiratayam, I actually want to show a picture of Shiratayam. And Lee, who asked about mistakes, I'm going to get to that as well. Okay. So uh, we saw in the beginning the piles of Torah sheets, and um, they have to be put together somehow. They are sewn. Um, they're sewn with a special thread called gid. I'm going to hold it up in my, my little window here. Um, gid is... a uh, Sorry for the, the I, I'm also an animal lover. It is, this is also made from um, animal sinew um, and it's very strong and, um, and it is what is used to sew the pages together. It's a very simple stitch, up, down, up, down, up, down. Um, on the right, you see a, a seam came apart and I went in to, you know, to re-sew it, to fix it, repair, re-sew re the seam. And, um, uh, you can see that up close, you know, there's a, a needle, usually, usually like a tapestry needle because the head is thick enough to fit the, the gied through. Okay. Uh, how much on average does it cost to make a material? So, uh, well, the parchment alone probably at this point costs like 6000 maybe even $7,000 just for the parchment and it doesn't come with anything written on it uh, blank. And then you know, the scribe's time a year or a year and a half. So figure whatever, you know, a year, year and a half salary is, add that. And then the ink and the, you know, the, the gid maybe a hundred dollars, the ink, some, maybe a little more, um, maybe 200, you know, it depends. Uh, I'm trying to remember how many bottles I even use, but you know, Torahs cost a lot. It's mostly, I mean, the materials cost a lot, but it's mostly the, the scribe's time. Um, and that is, that is why they are expensive. And, but I also think that's part of why they're valued is because they are all unique and they are special. If we printed them, you know, they wouldn't be, it wouldn't have that kind of special quality. Um, so this is the store that I mentioned that I get um, my supplies from. I always think, what if my ear stumbles upon this recording and like watches this? <laughs> it's like, hi, my ear. Um, so this is a store in Jerusalem. Not all the stores will sell to women, um, but we have a, a nice relationship with um, with this certain store. You can see in the in the background the cubby holes with all the parchment rolled up, and they have um, certain uh, humidity level conditions going on in their store, meaning like they're they're running at deep dehumidifiers, perhaps humidifiers at certain, uh, certain times of year, because the parchment wants to have kind of mid-level uh, humidity, like 50%, say, humidity, um, not too humid and not too dry, or it will affect the parchment. Um, 
And this on the left, this is me repairing a Torah. I, I like this picture both because of the line that I'm repairing. It's tzedek, tzedek, tir dof, justice, just as you'll pursue. It's a famous line in the Torah. But also because I happen to be wearing sparkling purple nail polish, which is just an unusual um, image uh, of someone writing a scroll. And in fact, uh, you know, for a while with this store in Jerusalem, we kind of had like a, felt like a don't ask, don't tell situation going on where they were maybe they thought we were buying parchment for our brothers or fathers or husbands um who were scribes and then you know eventually it, it came out we you know we told them that we were writing and and it, it's still so okay they said for a reform synagogue yeah well reconstructionist but yeah okay yeah someone noticed that the nail polish yeah exactly um so Okay. Is choosing the skin or vellum sort of similar to choosing watercolor paper? You know what? I don't know because I don't, I don't know what it's like to choose watercolor paper. I thought you'd just buy a package of watercolor paper. I didn't, I didn't know that you might have differences in, you know, if you buy a, like a, a ream of paper, would they all be different or you just mean like different types? So there are different companies. So there's that level, meaning different um, makers of the parchment. And then there are also um, just the fact that each animal is different. So each, literally each piece is different. So you have to look over each piece and try and guess at and get a sense of, is it, you know, too slick or, or too rough? And, um, but they're all going to be in, in sections and in parts too slick, too rough. Um, and, you know, you work with, work with that. Um, okay. So... Do I have to go to scribe school and be installed like Cantor's rabbi? So unfortunately, there is actually no scribe school for someone like me. Um, there is a scribe school for Orthodox men in Jerusalem. I, there may be more than one, I'm not sure. Um, but I, I trained the way that many, also many traditional male you know, Orthodox scribes trained, which is one-on-one -on -one from, from a teacher. So that, I think that, you know, that's also still like really a traditional way. Um, and then your teacher says, okay, you're ready for this. So it's not, it's not institutionalized um, in the same way as, you know, becoming, a, you know, going to school for five or six years and becoming a cantor or, or a, a rabbi. Um, are there restrictions when women are permitted to write? Pregnant, menstruating during holidays or Shabbat. So holidays and Shabbat, no writing. I mean, that's across the board, of course, not just for women. Um, well, it depends on the holiday, like Hanukkah, you can write holidays that have restrictions on doing work, um, like Shavuot, for example, um, no writing. And, and also interestingly, uh, you're not meant to write during the entire stretch of Sukkot and uh, Passover, even the intermediate days called the Cholomoed days. So that's kind of like an enforced break. Um, no, there, there aren't restrictions in terms of pregnancy, um, and uh, a scroll can't take on any kind of, uh, you know, if you're, if a woman is menstruating, it's, it's not, you know, it's not a problem either. That would really increase the timeline as well from a year and a half to like two. Okay. So... Yeah, uh, there was a couple questions about identifying um, Sifre Torah by a system of perforated dots. I'd heard of, I heard about that. I think there was a company doing something like that, but I, I'm just not, I don't know enough about it to really speak to it. Okay, so I'm going to get to the, the, the column number question in a second. I just want to talk a little bit about these special sections. So first of all, there are seven letters that get um, crowns or called tagin. This is on the right. Shatna's guts is the kind of like abbreviation. The shin, ayin, tet, nun, zayin, gimel, tzadi all get them whether in their regular or their final form. And on the bottom is kind of like different styles. Some people say the styles look like the scribe themselves. So like short and squatty, tall and lanky. Maybe that's true. Maybe that's not. And um, there are various sections that have special letters. So someone brought up uh, Shiratayam, which we're going to see in the next slide. Well, also on the top left here, this is, um, this is the part of the Shema, the, you know, the Shema, the entire section of the Shema co comes from the Torah, different sections spliced together. And the 
ayin of the word shma and the dalit of the word achad are large. And this is actually replicated in many prayer books. You'll see the large ayin and the large dalit. That's coming from the Torah. And there are other large letters as well. The bet of Bereshit, for example, is also large and also scattered throughout the scroll are large letters. Also, there are some tiny letters, some minuscule letters um, throughout the scroll. This, uh, these bat upside down nuns are uh, bracket a, a line in Bamidbar in Numbers, Vaihibin Soha Aron Vayomer Moshe, which we chant at the, at the Torah reading. Um, and they're symbols. It's the only time in the Torah where there are, there's anything except for letters. These are not letters, they are symbols. Um, so then, we're, yeah, we're not really, we're not really sure, but they are. Some people say that it brackets, that it means that that one line is a book unto itself. And on the left here, we do have Shirat Hayam. Um, some people say it looks like, you know, it's the, this is Shirat Hayam song at the sea that when the uh, Hebrews are crossing the sea, it says that the waters were like a wall to their right and to their left. So, so you could look at this as like a visual um, interpretation of that that one side is the wall, one side is the wall of water, the other side the wall of water, and then the people walking down the center, this like brick-like form. And on the uh, top right there, this is an example of dots above letters. So about 10 places there are dots above the letters. Um, the interpretation is potentially um, that we're not sure if that's if that was the right word, right, or the right, the correct letters. Um, and the rabbis often take this as an opportunity to add another level to the simple meaning of the story. So the example we're looking at right now is the, um, the re-meeting of uh, Jacob and, and Esau. And it says that Esau fell on his brother's neck and kissed him. But the rabbis did not trust that this is the case. And they said, well, you know, the word for to kiss is just one letter away from the word to bite. And that's why the dots are there, because you didn't actually kiss him. He bit him. So, but other rabbis say it's because he really meant that kiss. That's why the dots are there. So you can look at it in a number of ways. And there is one intentionally broken letter in many Torah scrolls that you will see. That is the vav in the word shalom in, um, in the brit shalom, the covenant of peace made with Pinchas, who was kind of uh, zealous in his actions. Now, someone asked about mistakes. You know, we started a little late, so we're going to go a little late. That's 5.30 now. We'll probably go another 10 minutes. Um, mistakes, you, you do not have to start over. There is a myth out there. Uh, I don't know if any of you have heard it, but I've heard it from people that they, they learned that if you make a mistake, you have to start the whole thing over. That is not the case. It's not the case for anyone that you know, it's not like, oh, because I'm not orthodox, like, oh, I, I sort of, no. Most mistakes are totally correctable. Um, it's not, you know, you can't just erase it with a eraser. That's, you have to, you know, it, 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 it's a process. You usually have to scratch it off, wait for the ink to dry, scratch it off, um, you know, prepare the parchment, rewrite the letter. There are certain mistakes that may not be able to be fixed. If you make a mistake in the name of God, um, names of God can't be erased like just, you know, like other names, like other words in the Torah. So it kind of depends what mistake you made, whether or not you can fix it. So worst case scenario, you may have to, you know, you may have to start that whole sheet of Torah over um, and bury, put in the Geniza, the sheet that has the, the, you know, the sheet that you've started that you can't use. Um, another scenario would be if you skipped a line and you didn't realize and you got to the bottom of the column and you had an extra line scored in all the all Torahs have score lines that you follow the top line and the letters go halfway down by the way you can't you know you can't really scratch off a whole column it would take forever it would look terrible so you'd have to rewrite that now what I'm showing you a picture of here this is a, a page from the St. John's Bible which was a project to write by hand and illuminate the entire Christian Bible the scribe here did exactly what I just described they accidentally skipped a line so what their solution was, they put the line at the bottom and then drew a birdie. And the birdie is flying up and its beak is pointing in the spot that the line is supposed to go. Now, of course, as I said before, the Torah can't even have any dots or the signature of the scribe. It certainly can't have a little birdie flying up. 
So you can't do that in the Torah, but I thought this was like a clever way of uh, dealing with it. Now, I mentioned I wrote my first Torah and a, a exhibit in San Francisco at a museum. A couple of years after that exhibit, there was another exhibit about Torah at the Jewish Museum in Berlin. I don't know if anyone remembers hearing about this, but instead of having an actual scribe write the Torah, they had this robot write the Torah. Um, the robot took the robot like three months instead of took me like 18 months, 14 or 18 months, something like that. Um, and of course the robot didn't make any mistakes and it all was perfect and et cetera, et cetera. But, um, but it wasn't kosher and they, you know, and they, they explained that up front and, and I'm sure there were a lot of conversations about why that is not considered kosher. Um, you know, in part, it comes down to intentionality. The thing that is at the beginning of every part of this process, the kavana, because a robot can't have kavana. A robot can't put intention, can't put a heart into the writing process. Um, and I think there's also something about the fact that each Torah, since it's written by hand, is to by a different person at a different moment in time, is totally unique. Whereas everything produced by a robot or printed um, all looks the same. And this, by the way, the conversation of whether you know, it can be mechanically produced. Of course, this came up with the advent of the printing press. And some people at that time did think that a, a Torah, a printed Torah should be considered a kosher scroll. But the people that thought not were the ones that kind of that won out. And that is still what we follow, which I think is, is really great because now a, a handwritten scroll of parchment, um, you know, written, written with a feather and ink or read and in ink is, is just, special, um, especially in the backdrop of, of everything. There are so many things being mechanized. Okay, I have just one more slide and then I'll look at the remaining questions and see if there's anything more um, and then we'll wrap up. So this is actually just a taste for, uh, for when we're saying goodbye. Um, this could be a whole class in and of itself. In fact, two years ago for Shavuot for My Jewish Learning, I taught a little bit, I taught a short class actually about this. Um, the Hebrew script that Torahs are written in is called Ashuri, as I mentioned earlier. Those two, two samples of these you can see on the bottom of the screen right now. The left is a sample of an Ashkenazi script. The right is a sample of a, of a oh, that is totally not right. I'm looking at it and I'm like, that's not Sparty. <laughs> Look at that chin. Uh, okay, sorry about that. At least I don't think, unless it's a, no, it just looks like a kind of a different version of the, all right, so my mistake. Um, but actually, more to the more of the point that I wanted to make is that um, the Hebrew that we use for scrolls and think of as Hebrew was not the Hebrew that was in use at the time that we would place like the giving of the Torah at Sinai or the early you know the early writings of the of parts of the Torah. The earliest Hebrew was closer to hieroglyphics um, and each of the symbols represented not sounds, but things. So if you look at the Proto-Canaanite, right, this is uh, 1500, approximately 1500 BCE. The, the reason there are doubles is because these are just multiple samples that, that researchers have found of each letter. That's why there are two, two symbols for each letter. Right smack in the center here, what does this, you know, squiggly line look like? If you were to guess, okay, what does this represent? Um, it's hard over Zoom. I, I hope some people are putting it in the box. Water. So how do you say water in Hebrew? Mayim. And the name of the letter, you can still hear what it used to mean, right? Mem is the name of the letter, Mayim. And this is true for all the letters, right? There was an evolution that, um, you know, eventually the, symbols that used to represent things ultimately came to represent just a single sound, completely abstracted from the thing it used to represent. So here we have right below the mem, we have what looks like a head, right? The way you say head in Hebrew is rosh, and this letter is a resh. You can hear the similarity. Um, this one is interesting also because our current letter looks nothing like it, but this is, a, this is an ancient ayin. And you can see what it looks like. It looks like an eye. And in fact, the way you still say eye, like eyeball in Hebrew, is ayin. 
Um, and again, th this is true for all the letters. And then you know, slowly, there, slowly there was an evolution. I put Phoenician here. Phoenician, very, very similar uh, to an early Hebrew, as you can see, about 500 years after this script. Um, and a lot of scripts are, descend from the script, right? So um, take the, this, this is the Aleph. Turn it, rotate it by 90 degrees to the right. And what do you see? An A. I, all, of the, all of these uh, Western scripts derive from basically the same, the same script. Now, Asherit was actually not a direct descendant of the early Hebrew, but kind of like from a branch that had gone to, that had spread to Babylonia, the area of Ashur, and then brought back. So that's just a taste of that. I'm going to stop the share and go to the chat box and look at your faces and see if there are any additional questions. I know I see there are a lot of guesses. Waves, mine, water. Some people think it looks like a mountain, which also is true. Okay. So I know there was a question earlier. I said I was going to get to it. Oh, about the, um, about the number of lines in a column. So that also really varies from Torah scroll to Torah scroll, or I should say it has varied in the past. These days, less variation. These days, most Torah scrolls have 42 lines per column. 42 is the minimum. Uh, there is the idea that it represents the number of places the Israelites camped in the wilderness. There are 42 places, you know what it says. And they went from here and they camped here and they, then they got up and they left and they camped here. There's 42 places. Um, uh, and it's not supposed to have more than 60. So, but you'll see a, a whole range and, and there are different, you know, traditions. You can sometimes tell, okay, if this has, if this scroll has 51 lines, you know, maybe it's from a certain region, 52, a certain other region. It's, so, it's kind of one way to identify um, scrolls. Okay, is there a certain size that the letters have to be? Is there such a thing as large print? Yeah, there is a, it varies. You can have really any size Torah. I have seen a Torah that was like this high. I mean, that must have taken years to write. It was tiny, tiny, tiny writing. So difficult. Um, and I've seen very large Torahs, right? Like, there are advantages and disadvantages to, I mean, a very tiny Torah. I think it's not super useful because you can't even see it. And a very large one is, is going to be hard to pick up. So medium size tends to be the size that a lot of communities are, are interested in. Um, okay. Um, other questions. A synagogue in LA commissioned a Torah to be written, funded by members of the community for a letter who went in and helped write the letters. Okay, yeah, and you wrote the shit. So that is um, definitely a common thing that happens. It helps, uh, you know, it helps pay for the writing of the scroll to kind of, you know, give a donation and then get to write one of the letters. And it allows you to kind of fulfill the 613th mitzvah, which is to write a Torah scroll. Um, because if you write one letter, you kind of read, wrote the whole thing. Because if the Torah was missing that letter, then you wouldn't have a Torah. Um, so yeah, and if you look at Torahs often, so the last few lines are often written in community. And if you look at them, they're kind of like, visually you know kind of like awkward because <laughs> it's when you write kind of one at a time different people it just it ends up looking different um it's but it's a really beautiful practice um how's the robot program to write the torah i don't know it, you can look you can google it it was called a uh, torah bot literally t-o-r-a-h-b-o-t um i'm not sure where where torah bot is now or what what torah bot is up to um but I'd be curious if uh, they're going to write another one in Gimel Plus Plus. <laughs> Very funny. Okay, how can one learn Hebrew calligraphy? So if and whoever is interested in Hebrew calligraphy, I would highly recommend, I'm going to write the name of this book. This is, uh, it's called Mastering Hebrew Calligraphy. It's by um, Izzy Pludwinski was also one of my teachers. And he covers everything. It may be an I at the end. I may have spelled that wrong. Okay. Um, 
yeah, the way of identifying who wrote a specific scroll, where it came from. There are ways, some ways to maybe identify where it came from, not necessarily foolproof ways, but various hints. There's no way to identify like an actual specific person. Um, anything special to know about the etzim? The, no, the etzim are, you know, typically made of wood. Um, and yeah, they have, the dowels have holes poked through them and the scroll is actually sewn with the gid, the same way that the sheets are sewn, sewn into the atzei chayim as well. Um, and sometimes those fall off too and they have to be re-sewn. Is the chet always two zayins connected or sometimes a zayin and above? But sometimes a zayin and above. So it depends on the script style. So um, the Beit Yosef, which is the script that I learned, it's two zayins with a bridge. And the, um, the Arizal is a vav and a zayin with a bridge. Okay. Yes, yeah, so someone actually... Okay, so... Um, probably one last question and then we'll close up. So how do we, uh, unless there's something else really urgent, um, how do how do we check the work, right? Like I said, for sure I make mistakes, all scribes make mistakes, but the Torah has to be perfect, right? The Torah can't have any mistakes. So how do you bridge that gap? So you have it proofread um, and that is a whole process. These days there is also a computer program <laughs> that you can you scan the each column of Torah, you send it, you know, and you, the program runs and it spits out pages upon pages of your mistakes. Um, it finds a lot, finds a lot of things that are not actually mistakes because it's overly sensitive. It thinks that letters are touching. They're not allowed to touch. It thinks they're touching when they're not actually touching, but it does find all the actual mistakes as well, which is just really remarkable. And, um, and then, and then, you know, you can fix them and, and, and that, that's that. So that's a, a really um, important piece of the, of the puzzle. Um, sorry, there are a couple more questions. How do you make the lines? The lines are made with, a, with an all. Oh, and I forgot. Sorry, if whoever wants to say, I mean, you know, no pressure, but I'm, I was going to show you, like on my other, on my other camera, I was going to show you how, what it looks like to write. The, the lines are made with a sirtu, uh, sorry, with a, the lines which are called sirtu are made with an all. Um, so it's just like a metal, like a sharp, it can be made also in the past. It's been made with the other sharp things like the thorn of a rose. Um, and, you know, evenly like in the same, you know, the same amount of space between each line. Okay. And the layout, Jennifer, the layouts of different Torahs are not all the same. So you can't necessarily look at one Torah and know, uh, you know, and, and be sure that the next Torah you look at, it's going to start, you know, with that same word on the, that column. Okay, so I am going to switch my camera and just give you, what, what word should I write? Who has a suggestion? Shalom is a nice word. I will write shalom. Okay, I'm going to spotlight. Um, oh, you already did it, because Mira, you're so on it. Okay, so, <laughs> all righty. We'll start with Shalom. Okay, how's the focus? It could be a little bit more focused. I'm so sorry. Like, no, no, no. Just, I'm, I'm so glad focus. you said something. Sometimes the lighting is like a little difficult. Let's see. How's that? Be better. Yay. Great. The shit is one of the letters that gets to gain.
Yeah, sometimes I can write like two words, maybe sometimes three with before redipping. So, yeah, I mean, it got easier with practice. So, um, if anyone who's thinking of learning, I totally encourage you. I was not a natural by any stretch of the imagination. I just practiced a lot. Um, and eventually, you know, eventually you improve. So, um, Thank you all for being here. I wish everyone a Chag Sameach, Fun Shavuot up at the mountain. And um, I hope you receive the Torah that you are ready to receive this holiday. And thank you, Mira, for hosting. <laughs>